Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to be together on this last Sunday of Advent and also Christmas Eve. I'm impressed with how many people have read articles of clothing, although I must say I think this side of the church is winning on the red (laughs) articles of clothing. But it is good to be together, it's good to have you here, and it's also great uh, to have those of you who are joining us online. No matter how we worship, it is good to do it together. In recognition of those who walked this land before us here in Simcoe County, we acknowledge that we gather on the ancestral territory of the Anishinaabek peoples, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi, who are collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We remember, too, the people of the Wendat, who once made this land their home. We acknowledge with regret that in the past we have not lived in harmony with the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island and that our relationship has not been one of true friendship based on honesty and generosity and mutual respect. It is my hope that we can all recognize that we have much to learn from the history and culture and teachings of the indigenous peoples with whom we share this land. And I also hope that we are all committed to nurturing a spirit of respect and honesty and reconciliation with all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit neighbours. There are several special days in this congregation that we'll be remembering this week. Today is Kayla Spruill's birthday. On the 26th, it's Alan Patterson's birthday. It's Andy Ford's birthday on the 27th. And it's Ruth Fountain's birthday on the 30th. So let's sing to them all. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And many more. We had our last Feed My Sheep of the season this uh, past Monday, and they uh, created a lovely card for us, and it just says, thank you for hosting Breakfast of Champions and the donations of the clothes, the warm winter clothes that we sent to them through the love box from the students of Harriet Todd. So they're sending their love to us to say thank you, so I thought I would share that with all of you who have uh, continued to help supporting that ministry that we have. I also personally want to thank you all for your Christmas cards and greetings. It has been delightful to hear from so many of you at this time of year, and I am grateful. Tonight is our candlelight Christmas Eve service. It will be family friendly, and we're having it at 5 o'clock to make it easier for those who have little ones or who just want to get home before it gets too late. Um, So I would invite you to come and bring your family or or invite some neighbours that might have little ones, uh, and I hope you will enjoy that. At the end of that service, we'll invite you to take one of the ornaments from the tree um, to help remember the lessons of the gift of being present that we've been focusing on this Advent. So as you can see, the tree is covered with little presents, and that those were all uh, made with gr- great love and care by the folks at Knit One Pray Too. So uh, they have a little um, uh, note on them for you and marking that this is your gift from 2023. So if you can't come tonight, feel free to take one uh, after the service today. So you have that for your tree. Next Sunday, I will be enjoying some time off with my family, and uh, I'm very grateful that Gord Timbers will be leading worship for us that day. Um, This week, during the week, we'll also be taking a break from the regular uh, activities at St. Mark's during the week. And a reminder that this, uh, this week is the last week to contribute to the Advent Challenge. So please, if you want to give a donation for that cause, uh, mark Advent Challenge on your envelope as you give your gifts today. Uh, you may remember that we are, have div- chosen three different ministries of the Presbyterian Church in Canada to support. We're going to be planting olive trees in Palestine supporting Indigenous ministries here in Canada and doing food uh, sustainability in various areas of the world in which Presbyterian World Service and Development operates. So it is a wonderful thing to be able to do, particularly at this time of year, and we have done it uh, for for many years, uh, and I would uh, just commend that to your 
to your care. Let's take a moment now just to quiet our hearts and our minds as we prepare to worship God. The faith narrative that we hear during Advent is careful to show us a lineage from King David to Jesus. It's no ordinary lineage. It's one that began in the shepherding of sheep, of leading and delivering the people in search of a home. Mary's womb becomes part of that lineage of love, offering the world the gift of God's presence in the flesh. As we enter the story of the birth of love among us, we're invited to be present with love. We may think the perfect gift is outside our reach to give, but in reality we have all that we need, our heart's love and presence. was beautiful, wasn't it? We unwrap a present on this last Sunday of Advent with great anticipation for the gift that God will reveal. Sue? We open our hearts as we open the gift. The promise of love is the divine gift we receive. And what will we do with it? The gift of love is the essence of the birth of Christ. The Holy One wanted to be so present to us that God's Spirit became flesh in order to inhabit the gifts of touching, healing, comforting, and challenging. Love is the clarion call to us as Jesus' disciples. The more light we put into the world, the more love we put into the world, the better the world will be. We light this candle of love as a sign that we will be present with love in the world. I would invite you now to join in singing, er, saying together this prayer. Holy, living light of God, you are our loving presence. Let this love grow in our lives each day so we can be a present of love to others. Unwrap and open our hearts. May it be so. Amen. Our first hymn is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, and if you are able, I would invite you to stand and join in singing that beautiful hymn. Jesus. 
would invite you now to share the peace with those who are sitting near you, not necessarily with handshakes or hugs as we are in that season again, but uh, with the words, the love of Christ be with you and then respond with we also and also with you. Well, this week, as I said, we had our last uh, Feed My Sheep uh, for, for this year. We'll start again at the last Monday in January. But there's two stories I want to tell you from our, our Monday at Harriet Todd last week. So some people came very festively attired, and Miss Lori was wearing a Santa hat. And one of the little boys, who may have a few more challenges in life than, than some of the other kids, said to her, are you Miss, uh, I can't remember the name, Miss so-and-so. And the little girl sitting across the table from him said, no, nah, it's just a bunch of old people here. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the gifts of doing breakfast at Harriet Todd is keeping us humble. <laughs> But the other story I want to tell you is of uh, whenever the kids come, I, I get to, to serve out the sausages, which is the first thing in line that they get after they get their plates. And if they, if they say to me, could I have two sausages, please? I always try to, to say what nice manners you have, because I think it's good to recognize it when kids uh, show nice manners. And one of the little girls said to me, yeah, sometimes I use them at home too. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, hmm, out of the mouths of babes, because I think that is true, isn't it? Sometimes we use our good manners when we're out in public with people we don't really know, people we may never ever even see again, and then when we're at home, we don't necessarily choose to use our kind and loving words and our good manners with the people we are supposed to love the most. We sometimes take them for granted, but I would say that it's more important, it's always good to have good manners, but it's even more important to choose your words wisely. Use kind words, use loving words when you are with those you love, because it's important each and every day to show people that you love them. And I uh, received from Peter this week a poem uh, via email, and it's a poem by the poet Dennis Lee to acknowledge the loss of his friend and fellow poet, Al Purdy. And it's short, but I think it really says it all. So I'm going to share it with you now. Tell the ones you love, you love them. Tell them now. For the day is coming, and also the night will come, when you will neither say it, nor hear it, nor care. Tell the ones you love. I have lost many who mattered, and I will say it again. Tell the ones you love, you love them. Tell them now. Love you, <laughs> thank you, I love you, Bob. <laughs> so thank you, Peter, for that. And uh, I'm always grateful for the lessons that we learn as we go to Harriet Todd. <laughs> I'm going to invite Irene to come and share with us. No, Marilyn. I'm going to invite Mar Sorry, Sorry, Irene. <laughs> to Marilyn to come <laughs> and share with us our readings this morning. Good morning. Our first reading this morning is from 2 Samuels, chapter 7, verses 1 to 11. King David didn't start out a king. He started out as a caretaker of sheep. God's anointed ones, whether that is a king like David or the Christ, which means anointed one, come time and again. In our faith narrative from humble beginnings, from those who tend carefully to those in their care. Hear this excerpt from the book of 2 Samuel. When David finally settled into the palace and Yahweh gave him rest from enemies on every side, he said to the prophet Nathan, 
Here I am, living in this house of cedar, while the ark of God sits in a tent. Nathan replied to David, Go, do whatever you have in mind, for Yahweh is with you. That night the word of Yahweh came to Nathan and said, Go and tell my servant David that this is what Yahweh wants. Are you the one to build me a temple? I have been without a temple from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with the tent as my dwelling. <clears throat> Whenever I traveled with the people of Israel, I did ever say to the governor whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a temple made out of cedar? Now then, following sheep to the ruler of my people of Israel, I have been with you wherever you went and destroyed all your enemies in your faith. I will give you fame like the fame of the great ones on the earth. I will provide a place for my people Israel. I will plant them where they will have a home of their own, a place where they will never be disturbed. Never again will the sinners oppress them as they did in the past, ever since the time I anointed judges to lead my people Israel. I will give you security from all your enemies. Furthermore, I alone will establish your house. Now we'll do the responsive reading, Psalm 89, verses 1 to 4. The gift of God's presence permeates the scriptures and finds its culmination in the presence of God among us, living and in the flesh. God's love is steadfast from generation to generation. We are the heirs of the kingdom, the family of God. No matter what happens in this world, we are not alone. Let us read responsibly. Forever I will sing the wonders of your love, Yahweh, proclaiming your faithfulness to all generations. I'll tell them that your love stands firm forever. Your fidelity is fixed in the heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen, sworn an oath to David, my faithful one. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm throughout all generations. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
I know I say thank you every week, but really your music just adds so much to our worship experience. So thank you all. That was wonderful. And so it is that the child of love comes from the most humble of families. Though we are sure to be informed by the gospel writer that Joseph was from the lineage of David. While David had built a house for God in his time, Mary's womb became a house of the holy in hers. She accepts the role she is given to be present with love growing inside of her. Our reading is from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. Six months later, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town in Galilee named Nazareth to a young woman named Mary. She was engaged to a man called Joseph of the house of David. Upon arriving, the angel said to Mary, Rejoice, highly favored one, God is with you. Blessed are you among women. Mary was deeply troubled by these words and wondered what the angel's greeting meant. The angel went on to say to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You'll conceive and bear a son and give him the name Jesus, Deliverer. His dignity will be great, and he will be called the only begotten of, son, begotten of God. God will give Jesus the judgment seat of David, his ancestor, to rule over the house of Jacob forever, and his reign will never end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have never been with a man? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Hence the offspring to be born will be called the Holy One of God. Know, too, that Elizabeth, your kinswoman, has conceived a child in her old age. She who was thought to be infertile is now in her sixth month. Nothing is impossible with God. Mary said, I am the servant of God. Let it be done to me as you say. And with that, the angel left her. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. In the name of God the Father, our Creator, God the Son, our Redeemer, and God the Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen. Well, this time of year, in our tradition, we tend to think a lot about Mary. And that's understandable, as she's one of the central characters in the Christmas story. Last week, we pondered the question of what exactly Mary might have said when Joseph told her she had to ride a donkey, 90 miles up a 2,500-foot mountain in the ninth month of pregnancy in order to answer questions for a census. Perhaps she looked at that donkey and thought, am I going to ride that thing or not? And I think there are times that we can all relate to that questions when we encounter various challenges in our own lives. But let's get back to the question of who exactly is Mary? It seems like everyone you ask has a different answer to that question. In our culture, often Mary is a figure in a snow dome or in a miniature stable, silent, immobile, and gazing at a baby in the manger. A plastic figure to be taken out of a box of ornaments a few times a year. But to Roman Catholics, she is a venerated figure. Catholics believe that Mary acts as a go-between between between us sinners here on earth and God in heaven. During the Middle Ages, when the church's leadership became more and more distant from people, Mary became important in the prayer lives of common folks. She was seen as one who could empathize with their plight and mediate forgiveness. In the councils of the church through the centuries, she gradually gained supernatural qualities. 
She was declared to be absolutely free from personal sin before her birth and to this day. She remained perpetually a virgin. She did not die a natural death, but was taken directly from earth to heaven. Protestants, like us, may feel Roman Catholics overemphasize Mary's role. Because for many Protestants, Mary is just a peasant woman chosen to facilitate the arrival of the Son of God into the world. On the other hand, Roman Catholics may feel that we Protestants underemphasize Mary's role in salvation history. Alice McKenzie, a, a really smart woman who I read often, has written in an article, both worship of Mary and reducing Mary to her biological role miss out on something very important. Mary's example as a person of faith, struggling with the daily demands of her life. Is, it is this Mary who can help us prepare spiritually for the coming of her son. So where do we go to find such a Mary? Not to Mark, who never mentions her. Not to Matthew, who focuses on Joseph. Not to John, who tells us that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and doesn't share any of the details as to how that would have happened. It's in the Gospel of Luke, where... Luke portrays the fullness of Mary's humanity as an example for all of us. Luke cracks open that snow dome and lets Mary out to stand, flesh and blood, life-size, before us and invite us to participate with her in giving birth to and raising and mourning and eventually following Jesus Christ our Lord. Luke portrays her in a startling role, one that shakes up the way we've been brought up to think of her and invites us to stop observing her and start imitating her. So this past week, as I looked at what our gospel reading was, I spent a good deal of time pondering Mary and the visit from the angel Gabriel to her when she was just a young teenage girl. So today I'm going to take some poetic license as I imagine what she might have been thinking as a, a lady later on in her life as she remembered that day, the day that she drew water from the well in the middle of the small town of Nazareth. It was hot that day. Well, it's usually hot in Nazareth, but it was the middle of the day with the sun shining directly overhead. There was just a little bit of shade near the well, and so I lingered there for a few minutes before returning home with my water jar filled to the brim. I was lost in my own thoughts. Well, to be honest, I was thinking about Joseph, the carpenter my parents had arranged for me to marry. He was a good man, and not bad-looking either. As I said, I was daydreaming when suddenly I heard a man's voice. It was one I'd never heard before. And it said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. And I looked around and I was thinking, Who is he talking to? Who in Nazareth is favored with the Lord's presence? I was pretty sure I was the only one at the well drawing water that day. And what exactly did he mean, favored one? And why would the Lord be with me? Well, sure enough, as I turned around, there was this, well, being standing before me. He looked like a man, but he had this glow about him. I was sure I didn't know him, and so I worried, why would he want to speak to me? It wasn't the normal thing for a man, a stranger, to speak to a young woman who was alone. Perhaps I, I looked as shocked as I felt because then he went on, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus, and he will be great 
and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. I will never, ever forget every single word he said. My mind was racing, and I was remembering the stories of some of our ancestors and how God had called them. Isaiah and Ezekiel, well, they saw visions. Jeremiah heard only a word. Elijah, a still, small voice in the silence of his heart. And yet all I could think was, why would God be asking this of me? And then as his words sunk in, I was thinking to myself, wait a minute, how can this be since I am a virgin? And I must have shared that thought out loud because the man started to explain, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. As I took in his words, I began to understand why he had started our conversation by saying, do not be afraid. Who wouldn't be afraid to hear that this is what God had in store for them? I was going to become pregnant and the child would be God's son. I can tell you from that day on, anytime someone begins a conversation with the words, now don't be afraid or don't worry, you can bet I started to become a little more than a bit afraid and more than a little bit worried. Now I was afraid then because in my town, if someone becomes pregnant before they're married, well, they could be stoned at worst or shunned at the very least. And what about my Joseph? He was a good catch, that Joseph. He descended from the house and lineage of King David. I never imagined that someone with royal blood would want to marry me, but he did. And we'd been betrothed for several months now. What would he think? What would he say? How could I ever find the right words to explain what was happening to me so that he would believe me? My head was still reeling when the angel started to talk again. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. I, I remembered Elizabeth. She was a cousin of mine. We'd met a few times, but because she lived up in hill country and because she was much older than I, I didn't really know her well. We all knew she and Zachariah were childless, and given their ages, this news that she was expecting came as a great shock. I was thinking that the Holy Spirit must have been really busy when the angel concluded his conversation with these words, nothing is impossible with God. And all I could think to say in that moment was essentially, Yes, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. How was I to know what I was getting into? As I think back over the life of my precious child, I remember so many moments. They're in my mind, just as real as they were all those years ago. I remember fleeing to Egypt as refugees, with a newborn tucked inside my cloak, fearing for our lives. I remember searching for him in the temple when he was just a boy. My heart was racing and I was afraid until I found him that day. I remember the wedding at Cana when I thought, enough is enough, it's time he started his ministry. And I encouraged him to help our friends who had run out of wine. And he did. I learned that day that my son, my Jesus, could bring abundance to all he touched. 
I remember standing outside a house in Bethany hoping he'd learn not to be so bold, not to anger the temple authorities. And I remember that awful day at Golgotha, watching as my son hung on a cross in agony. My heart broke at the sight, and I couldn't help but remember that night when I could protect him in my arms in that grubby cave in Bethlehem. How I longed to be able to shelter him again. As I think back on all of it, I realize what a gift God gave to me. I was allowed to birth beauty and hope and joy and peace into the world. I was truly given the gift of love that day so long ago in Nazareth. And as I think back on all that happened since that moment, I can see now how blessed I was that God chose me. I don't know why. I was a simple girl from an insignificant little town, but God showed favor to me. I wonder if you have times when you can't figure out what it is that God may be calling you to do, if you're worthy of doing anything for God. Know this, dear ones. No matter that you may not have done Anything of much import in your life, you are blessed. That's what blessing is. It's unmerited favor. The important thing is to know that you are blessed, just as I was. And please take these words to heart. Rejoice, O favored ones. The Lord is with you. The angel was right. Nothing is impossible with God. All we have to do is show up and be open to trusting the promises of God that ultimately all things work together for good for those who serve the Lord. And once you believe that, you too will do incredible things for God. May you experience the hope, peace, joy, and love that are available to each of us every time we say yes to God. And remember, the Lord is with you, and you need not be afraid. Amen. is a saying that love hurts. Indeed, when we open ourselves to the gift of love for others, we risk the chance that our compassionate hearts will break for the world we live in. But the alternative, isolation and apathy, carries a greater cost. We ourselves become the lonely ones. We ourselves are left with an atrophy of the heart rather than its expansion. Being the gift of presence can complicate life in the end, but it is the only way to survive this human life. We'll begin our prayers today with three questions, each followed by a short silence. Focusing intentionally on thoughts and memories can be a kind of prayer, bringing our lives into a conversation with the Holy. So I would invite you to take a deep breath in and out and close your eyes if you're comfortable doing that. 
The first question to consider is this. Who was a gift of presence to you this week? Did you experience their attention in a way that felt like a special connection? Take a moment to recall this in your mind's eye, seeing it emerge like opening a gift. If you cannot recall such a moment, that's okay. This week you may moment, notice these moments more deeply. The second question is this, how did you offer yourself as a gift of presence? What did it feel like to extend your attentiveness and availability beyond yourself? Did you notice how it made a difference to someone else for you to be truly present to them? The third question is this, is it possible that God's presence is felt more acutely in these moments when we truly tend to one another? What could you do this coming week that would allow God's gift of love to flow through you to someone else? It may be as simple as finding opportunities to speak an encouraging word, or as complex as actually lifting up someone else's circumstances through volunteering or donating. Please join now in singing right here and right now. In this prayerful present moment, we train our attention on those who are in distress. As we scan the headlines, we see a world that is broken, fragmented, shattered by war and conflict. We name Ukraine, entering its 665th day fighting Russia. We remember the suffering in Yemen with 233,000 deaths, including 131,000 from indirect causes such as lack of food, health services, and infrastructure. We mourn Palestine and Gaza with over 20,000 deaths and over 2 million people who are, were displaced in a matter of two months. May all nations rise up in compassion for all women and children, elders, and non-combatants who are caught in war. We pray for Israel as a week-long ceasefire is being proposed in exchange for hostages. We see a world that needs your presence as much as it did the incarnation of Christ in Bethlehem. Palestine 2,000 years ago. We pray also this day for those who are ill of body, mind, and spirit, particularly if they are not able to be home at Christmas in a place they love with people they love. May you use us to share your love with them at this time. In this prayerful present moment, we train our attention on thanksgiving and joy. 
we give you thanks for all those who are called to work this Christmas. We pray for health care workers, emergency services workers, all those who labor so that we can enjoy Christmas with those we love. We give thanks this week for the many acts of love that are being carried out in our community as we prepare for Christmas. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to remember the needy, not just at Christmas, but all year round. We are grateful for the gifts of friends and family and the joy that can come when we gather together with open and loving hearts. Bless our Christmas gatherings. Bless our travels. Bring us back together with full hearts ready to serve you. In this prayerful present moment, we ask you, Christ Jesus, the greatest gift of all, to help us savor our journey toward the celebration of Christmas. Help us recognize and create moments of sweet presence rather than filling the voids with the things that do not last. Help us to stop and notice what we're experiencing and accept it with open hearts and minds. In doing this, we allow you to meet us in the right here, right now, right where we are. Amen. This is the Advent Sunday of love. At this time of year, we often give gifts to others to express our love for them. So may your offering this day be a sign of your love for God and for those in God's world who need love to brighten difficult times. The offering will now be received. God of love and grace, we are so grateful for the gift of love you sent to us that first Christmas day. Receive and bless these gifts that we give in the name of that love to bless this world you love so much. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 
Before we sing our last hymn, I realize that um, before the, the uh, service started, Barb told me that someone had left some glasses here in a pew back. Oh, well, look at that. <laughs> we have a winner. <laughs> and there's also a... Um, that was mine. Well, <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> I didn't need to go far. <laughs> okay, well, that's, that, that's all. My work, my work here is done. <laughs> um, I would invite you now to join in singing our final carol for this morning, the first Noel. discern how to live faithfully as we surf the internet choosing which sites will get our attention as we choose news sources that will shape our worldview 
as we buy groceries and steward our resources. We are always making choices about how we love the world that God so loves, how our attention and our presence participates in the mission of God, which is abundant life for all. So go now and be truly present so you may be the gift of presence for others. That's all that is expected of you, that the gift that is you is the best gift you can give. In the name of the Holy Presence, the divine gift and the spirit of love that is just waiting for us to unwrap abundant life. Amen. Mm -hmm.